Bueno, muchas gracias a todos los que han permanecido en este momento. Los que están eh, todavía por llegar, les invitamos a tomar asiento. Vamos a comenzar con nuestro conversatorio para dar cierre a nuestra tercer Feria de Lenguas Extranjeras. Feria Internacional de Lenguas Extranjeras y tenemos bueno un número de personalidades con nosotros que les voy a pedir en este momento que si se pueden tomar un par de unos segundos para presentarse cada uno. Empezamos si quieres de este lado. Las damas por delante, ¿no? Primero las damas. Hola, buenas tardes, Mariana Murguía, sus órdenes. Um, gerente de Operaciones Académicas en Instituto Certified Learning and Development. Qué gusto, muchísimas gracias por la invitación y pues bendita aquí entre esos caballeros. Eh, David Fay, eh, soy el director de la oficina regional de programas de inglés acá en la embajada en la Ciudad de México. Ignacio Chávez, la mayoría estaban aquí en mi plática, pueden buscarme así, teacher Ignacio Chávez, estoy a la orden. Gabriel Díaz, uruguayo, con Y y profesor. Brian Kilkenny. Um, I'm a teacher and director of the multicultural program in the Tec de Monterrey, Prepa Tech Santa Anita. Mauricio Ortega, consultor académico, consultor editorial para Live ABC en América Latina. Gracias. Muchas gracias y tenemos a... Bueno, Dante González, coordinador académico de la Dirección de Lenguas Extranjeras. Y Sim Simón Madrigal Caro, director de Lenguas Extranjeras de la Secretaría de Educación. Un gusto que estén todos por acá y un gusto tenerlos a todos en este panel tan importante, mucha personalidad. Desarrollamos unas cuantas preguntas, se las podemos hacer en español o en inglés como gusten. Y vamos a pedirles el, la opinión o el input de cada uno de ustedes, tomándonos un par de minutos para contestar cada una de las preguntas. Eh, comienza, si quieres, con la primera. Ok. La primera pregunta es, ¿cuáles estrategias efectivas de gamificación se pueden aplicar en el aula de clases para mejorar el aprendizaje del inglés, aprovechando al máximo los recursos tecnológicos disponibles? Uh, so, go, go ahead and read it in English too. Um, English, well. Spanish, what do we do? Uh, if you want to make the question in English, and uh, you can answer in whichever language you want. Again? Okay, so what effective gamification strategies can be applied in the classroom to enhance English language learning, making the most of available technological resources? First thing is, in my humble opinion, uh, gamification in itself is a way of teaching. So there has to be some slight competition, but not saber tooth competition. There has to be achievable levels, and there has to be acknowledgement of those levels. So good assessment programs, and there have to be some kind of rewards. If you factor in those three things, I think those are the best strategies. And in so far as you use technology, for transactional purposes, not just drag and drop, but students doing something with the language. Every time the CEP, the Secretary of Public Education in Mexico, comes with a new program, with something new for us to do, I, as an English teacher, say, you have to worry about it. We're always doing that. They always ask us to have uh, dynamic classes, uh, participation of students, uh, learning for a purpose, and that's what we do in the classroom. So just keep in the way, as, as he said, uh, gamification is our way of teaching most of the times. So I would just say keep that enthusiasm in your classes, get together with kids, because they're going to give you the tools for that. Once, once a, a teacher told me, learn about teaching children. And that's going to help you with kids, teens, adults. 
And, well, I think that's a good recommendation. Play, enjoy, and as you said previously, have fun in the class. I, I look around the Recrea uh, event and I see it everywhere. Right behind you, you see the, the, the uh, virtual reality gaming that's, that's happening. Um, I, I think it was said this morning, I think, Gabriel, you, you may have mentioned it, the feeling of success, that, that students feel like they're making progress, even if it's small steps at a time. Feeling valued, uh, I think teachers here at Recrea are feeling valued, and I think students need to feel valued and engagement. They have to connect with others. And hopefully, yesterday and today, you've been engaging with other educators. So I, I would say those three things are the key. OK, good. Well, as a strategy, I would think that we need to first set up the objectives that we want for our students to see what are we going to use, what kind of gamification we can use for them. So once that we set that up, we can find the different apps or the different programs or the different um, tools that we already have with technology. So first we, we have to do that and then we can engage our students uh, using that, through that, through um, artificial intelligence, through different uh, digital platforms. We have lots of them, but first we have to set up what do we want for our students? How do we want to teach them? If it's uh, grammar, okay, find the best way or the best app or the best program for them so you can teach them. But first, we have to set up those sort of things. I, when I tried to incorporate um, gamification in my classrooms, I did it not only for the English, but also for certain behaviors. Like I had a, I teach high school students and a lot of them want to go to the bathroom. And so instead of just saying yes or no, I started to incorporate some things where they had to earn points. One would be by attending class, getting there on time, bringing their material that slowly earns some points. Uh, turning in homework assignments earns you points. And then as you earn enough points, you want to go to the bathroom during class, all right, I just checked my Excel really quickly. Yes, you have it, go ahead. And it took that pressure off of me as a teacher being the, the gatekeeper, like yes you can, no you can't. And from there you can start adding extra bonuses. Teacher, I need another day to turn in this assignment. Can I? Oh, that's gonna cost you, that's, that's an expensive uh, you know, power up. You better have the points, that's gonna cost you 100. And if they do have it, go ahead. And those kind of gamification features with, with behavior, I found was very useful. Right, uh, so you're asking for the best strategy to start working with gamification. I would like to quote, perhaps, at least in my opinion, uh, the expert on strategies, General Tzu Tzu, the one who wrote the book, The Art of War. And he says one of the best strategies is get to know thy enemy. In this case, this part can be divided into two. Part number one would be getting to know students, just as you have already mentioned. What they do, what they like, what they dislike. The second part is know what you're going to be facing. Because just as Ignacio mentioned it, it's one thing that we have to adapt to. So first thing to do is get to know what kind of games, what kind of apps, what kind of IA is going to be available, become familiar, and then we can start working with that. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias por las respuestas. Se dan cuenta, inclusive, podemos estar de acuerdo en que estamos en desacuerdo. Se vale. We can agree that we don't agree. ¿Cuál es el papel fundamental que desempeña el educador en la enseñanza? especialmente en el contexto de la inteligencia artificial y otras tecnologías para potenciar la experiencia educativa de los estudiantes. What is the crucial role that educators play in teaching, especially in the context of artificial intelligence and other technologies, to enhance the educational experience of students? Can we start from here? Well, teachers are set to play many roles. A second ago, you mentioned gatekeeper. 
Sometimes we are secretaries. We remind students of things to do. Sometimes we're also clowns. We have to make something funny to break the ice. In this case, we are supposed to be mentoring and tutoring. So uh, before we go in there, I think we also have to remember that we have to have and keep a balance. Because before we play a role, we have to be the role first. So if I want to teach my students how to play with one piece of new technology, I have to be a subject of this new technology and I have to ask first. So leaving the experience, I can start now teaching my students yeah, how to get the best from that. I, I completely agree with that, Mauricio. We have a lot of roles and, and one of them is curator. We decide which technology they use, which AI we're going to allow them to use. But first, we have to understand it. We have to know how it's used, the pros and the cons, so that we can communicate that to the, the students. I think that's very important. But remember, we're the authorities in the classroom. We're going to be the, the curators. Choose which ones you're familiar with and that you think give benefits to your class and to your students. And then make sure that they follow those. Of course, we're guides and we're mentors, and we're going to have to help them along the way, training them, letting them know ethical uses, non-ethical uses. But remember, it's in our hands to choose which ones. Good. Well, maybe in the future, I don't know when, but we may become obsolete because we have a lot of technology. We don't want that, right? We are still here. And while we are still here, we have the responsibility to guide our students because there are, there's a lot of information there, a lot. And we have to find the way to guide our students through all these applications, through all this uh, technology, because they may think that what they're doing or reading or investigating is right. We have the tool of this technology, which is great. We have to use it. But we have to find the balance. Not everything is going to be in the use of technology. We are still here. We are the ones who knows. We are in front of the group. So we still need to find the way to engage them okay, as a guide. Because they still don't know a lot of things. And we, of course, that we have to be uh, trained about technology and all the things that are uh, becoming new and new and different kind of programs. So we are still here, and it's our responsibility to guide our students. So as long as we're here, we have the control, and we need to, to teach our students how things are working right now, and what does it work for them, and what do we want from them, and how do we want them to use these uh, tools that we already have. So we have to still uh, guide them, OK? so. That would be it for me. Uh, earlier today, Mariana had a session on AI. Uh, and I think the, the, one of the key takeaways is to always be ready to learn, to adapt. Um, as teachers, I think we need to model that learning as well. We need to show that we're able to learn, that we want to learn. And I, and I hope it's a sincere effort. Uh, I think students really get so much out of just seeing the learning process in their own teachers. I still remember my teachers from Primaria who were there and they were exhibiting in some way their own learning, um, especially in the area of special needs in the, in the class that I was, I was in. Um, I, I also like what Brian was saying about curating. Um, I, I think that's important, the critical media literacy component, really just trying to be as aware as possible, um, thinking about those, those value filters uh, that, that we, we probably need to look at at a personal level, um, uh, but, but also probably at, at an instant, institutional level. I'll just add that as the students get older, if, if you start looking at secundaria and prepa and university, I think it also helps them f f to understand what our filters are, how we are curating, because if they have a glimpse, if they have a, a, a sense of what the lenses are that we are using to curate um, the different uh, contents or, or tools, I think they will um, grow that much uh, faster. 
when when thinking about all the technology that the students are having in front of them, I think of what Mariana was saying at her lecture. Uh, they have a lot of information. They can find everything. They can even find us. And I was thinking, well, I hope they find me. <laughs> But when, when we have this access to information, the, the, the biggest problem I see is not being able to, to separate good materials from bad materials, real information from fake information. So I think we need to be ready to investigate, to go before them, so that when they come to us asking us for something, we know what they're talking about. We need to be there in, in our school. We call it presence. They call it presence. They say, you need to be present with the students. So I sometimes go and have my lunch with the students, listening to what they're talking about. Because with this information, with all this technology available for them, when they come to us, we need to be ready to, to guide them and to teach them how to be the, their own curators, you know, like making their choices so that they find better options for their own development. I try to apply when I have a problem, I try to apply the principle of Occam's razor, which is when you have a problem, try to solve it with the least possible ingredients. And to me, the most important role that we have as teachers is to organize for learning to happen. Using what all the resources that are available to us and that we have tried and tested and seen that result in good learning. So that means, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm the oldest person in this panel. I've been doing teaching for four decades and I went through the video is the latest technology. And, oh my God, the videos come pre-prepared. We are going to lose our jobs. Then computer assisted language learning came on board. And oh my God, we're going to lose our jobs. Come on. Every technology propels us forward. Even when technology is not designed for education. You know the only technology designed for education is the blackboard. It's the only technology. All other technologies are created for business purposes and applied to education. So use your resources and keep it simple. The most wonderful resource we have in class are the students and their life stories. Okay, next question. Um, ¿Cuáles son las transformaciones notables en el proceso de aprendizaje de idiomas gracias a las herramientas digitales y de qué manera debe evolucionar la metodología educativa en respuesta a estos cambios? What re remarkable transformations have occurred in the language learning process due to digital tools and how should educational methodology evolve in response to these changes? And then we go back and forth. Okay, my personal experience, social media, all sorts of technologies that we use in, in real life have been a wonderful complement to my job as a teacher. My students have better pronunciation because they play online role play games and they need to make themselves understood. They also communicate with people and create relationships across the globe through English. So in my sense, I would say that is the main thing, right? Nothing more fancy, just that. When, when I was a teacher before this social media stuff, I remember a student who used to look for words to come into the class and ask me for the meaning. Like, hey, teacher, how do you say? And he would ask me the strangest words. And I was like, I don't even know that in Spanish, <laughs> right? 
And I used to say, I don't know. But let's get a dictionary. And he was like, you don't know? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a dictionary. But let's look for it on a dictionary. So I think having new tools pushes us to, to teach them how to use them. And at the same time, it causes us to, to, to learn how to use them and to take advantage of them. I, I'm not a native speaker, and I find it really useful to have a tool that teaches the right pronunciation, because sometimes I don't have it. And I don't feel bad about it, because that means I'm bilingual, right? So when my students say, hey, I listen to this word, and they pronounce it differently, OK, listen to that, because that's a real one. But then you were pronouncing it right. Maybe I made a mistake, because maybe I learned it in an incorrect way. But let's learn it together. So whatever the tool it is, whatever the new technology that comes, the best thing we can do is learn how to use it, and use it for the best of the students. Um, I, I think the, the only little bit I'll add to, to what my, my two colleagues have said so far is the idea of access to content, uh, global content, relevant content, content of interest. Uh, it, it, it is something that did, did not have, uh, that I did not have growing up um, as, as the, one of the, one of the, the, the non-digital uh, schoolboys uh, way back when. Um, having said that, I'll also say it, it's, it's, it's a two-edged sword. Um, I worry about uh, students' ability to remain focused, to sustain some kind of interaction with a text for a longer period of time. Uh, you were talking, Ignacio, earlier about the one-minute TikTok, but you can't go more than three minutes now. You lose attention. Um, and I, I, th I, I think it's really critical that we uh, look both at the access to that variety of content, but also look at that uh, exchange between the reader and text, that, that magical thing that happens when there's a back and forth between text and, and reader. OK. Yes, well, all these uh, ideas are great. It's to add a little bit, I, I'd like to set, us, to set us up in the past and the things that, we're, that are happening right now in the present. Gabriel's, Gabriel was saying something about the, we used to have the blackboard, okay? And with the, I don't know how to say, like the tea sign, uh -huh. the chalk, uh -huh. and then we changed to the, the white one the, with the water markers, and then the projecting the images, and then like nothing, just something and, and nothing to write with. Okay, so it's we, we have to think about that how everything has been changing, and we're talking about that impact uh, in our students. But also, it's saying uh, the question about changing methodologies to adapt it. I I think that more than change it, it's adapted. Okay, because we know that the, the different kind of methodologies that we have, they work, or the active methodologies, or the things that are, are we're learning and teaching day by day, but adapt for the things that we have right now with technology and with the tools that we're having to use them to keep continuing the teaching but growing and for students to, to, get, to get the idea that we're still with the traditional situations because they work, but we're going forward with the technology. And we have to, to make that path with the two things together, with making a balance about it. But yes, we don't have, we shouldn't forget where do we come from because it worked. And it's, it's growing already, but, and it's going to be like, the impact is going to be even more because we have, it, the technology is growing day by day, like in very big steps. So we have to set up the students there. Um, I, I agree a lot with what you said. I don't think, I think technology helps us with the, the como, how, how we do things in the classroom. 
we don't have to change so much the methodology, but we're still going to be presenting. But how we present new material to the students can change with the technology we want to use. We want them to practice, but how they practice can change depending on the, the, the technology we use. If we want them to, to write text, to put pictures up in Instagram and comment on each other's posts, that's communicating and they're using technology to do that, something we couldn't do in years before. But they're still getting the practice. Um, I use a lot of what's up in my class. I have them do dialogues or, or videos of themselves using new vocabulary in conversations and then they send it to me. Would I have done that before? I would have done it in the class. So there's still speaking practice, pronunciation, but we're just using it, we're using technology as a different way, all right? As it advances, we're gonna be advancing. Uh, the question is about the changes. And uh, for this, I would like to mention two words, probably three. Uh, the first one is immediacy. Students want nowadays everything at that very moment. They're not going to wait for anything. Uh, two, as just Mariana mentioned at the very beginning, access. They have access to absolutely everything they want. But at the same time, there are too many things to choose. So I agree with you, technology, uh, sorry, methodology is still there. Uh, we have to adapt. But in this case, we also have to learn how this new generation is learning. Yeah, they are more relaxed. They are absolutely informal. And nowadays, they rely a lot on tutorials and on, uh, well, you mentioned that TikTok. So my task would be understanding that new, that change, and how I can apply everything I know, as Gabriel said it, yet to make learning happen. Muchas gracias. Hasta en este momento hay alguna pregunta eh, de los que estamos aquí presentes, si no para continuar. ¿Continuamos? Muy bien. La pregunta 4 y 5 que tenemos las voy a combinar porque son, se relacionan mucho. ¿En qué medida puede la inteligencia artificial influir en la dinámica de enseñanza-aprendizaje ¿Y cuáles son los pros y contras de su incorporación en el aula? ¿Cómo pueden los docentes adaptarse de manera efectiva a las nuevas necesidades de sus estudiantes, abrazando la tecnología como una aliada en lugar de un obstáculo en el proceso educativo? To what extent can artificial intelligence influence the teaching and learning dynamic? and what are the pros and cons of its incorporation to the classroom? How can teachers effectively adapt to the new needs of their students, embracing technology as an ally rather than an obstacle in the educational process? If you don't mind, I suggest Mariana get started because she gave the talk of AI. Yes, if you heard me in the morning, I talk a lot about this, about artificial intelligence, about how to adapt, about how are we supposed to use it as a tool, okay? Not as a substitute of the teacher. Because what happens with AI? It doesn't uh, do the thinking like a human does, okay? It doesn't feel anything. It doesn't have the criteria that we may have. It doesn't have emotions or feelings or uh, logic or uh, the ethics that we have. So how are we going to combine this in, in the classroom? How are we going to do it? Okay, we are still the main figure in the classroom. The students, yes, because of the active methodologies and we have a, a lot of them where uh, the students are the, the main uh, figure in the class. But we are going to use technology and artificial intelligence as a tool. We have to combine it. We cannot use only technology for our classes, and we cannot be, as we used to, only the teachers speaking like on the front of the class. That now it's kind of boring. 
So if we already have this kind of technology and we already have all these tools and applications and systems and programs that are very useful for teachers for uh, the, the learning of the languages and every kind of uh, subject that you might prefer, if you find it, if you look for it, you will find some way to use it for the teaching. But not forgetting that as a tool, not as a substitute. If you don't mind, I would suggest Gabriel to be the second one. Because of all the things that he knows in teaching and training teachers. I am cheating, I know, sorry. Now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I love artificial intelligence. And I'm going to tell you my, uh, my story from November 2022 up to now. November 2022, in the corridors of the university, somebody said, oh my God, they're going to cheat in all the exams. Now there's something that writes the papers for them. And I went, oh my God, this is going to be tough. We will have to reconsider evaluation. And I went into this panic, and all of a sudden I said, Gabriel, just wait. And I went back to a person who is still alive, but whom I read in the 80s, John Fancelow. He wrote a wonderful book called Breaking Rules. And I said, he was the first disruptor in language pedagogy back in the 80s. And one of the things that John says is, when you face one of these moments, just change one. And he did in the 80s, crazy things. For example, teaching the class from the back of the room instead of at the front of the room. So it was just one change and seeing what happened. And honestly, to me, artificial intelligence now is one of the most helpful and useful tools for my students' learning and also for my teaching. I'm going to be honest. I need to adapt texts to a certain level, I go to ChatGPT. I, I need a funny story I cannot think of. ChatGPT, tell me a funny story. I help my students improve their English. They are all going to be language teachers, but they are non-native speakers, and they, have, they are still learning English. So before submitting key assignments, I ask them to run the assignment through JGPT and submit both versions, not just the second one. So start thinking, what one thing would you change to incorporate AI to your classes? That is my story, very personal. Who do you want to speak now? <laughs> I merely made a suggestion. Nah, I'm just kidding, yeah. I'm just kidding. Uh, well. Yeah, my turn, I cannot escape this time. Um, I would go back to two things that we have mentioned already. The first one, get to know it. Yeah, myself, I'm already asking for directions on how to access ChatGPT because I don't know it. Guilty. So we have to get to know it. And just quoting people back to themselves, education is not about technology. Education is about education, about techniques, strategies, input, feedback that we give our students, yeah, and how we help them deal and understand their own process of learning. So the first thing would be getting to know one bit of technology, and remember, just as Gabriel very rightful said, it is a tool, and as a tool, I have to know how to use it. He mentioned the blackboard. Mariana mentioned the whiteboard. Yeah, and we can all have examples of overhead projectors, of PowerPoint, of Canva right now. All we have to do is learn how to use it and start applying it. That would be my response. I, I use ChatGP in my classes too. Um, I don't think we should demonize any technology. I think we should include cell phones in the classroom. I think we should include 
uh, artificial intelligence when we can in the classroom. Whatever resource you think is helpful, please include it in your classroom. And ChatGTP, a lot of AI we're already using. If you have your telephone and you're connected to the internet, you're using AI. There are chat bots, there's algorithms that tell us what to watch next, whether it's YouTube or Netflix or Spotify. The navigation system I used to get here today sent me through roads. All of that is artificial intelligence, so don't be scared of it. We have to try to use it. And as far as, as cheating, I mean, I, I teach high school students, but as a, as a English as a second language or foreign language teacher, I'm not expecting them to write theses. I'm not expecting them to write three or four page papers. A clear, coherent paragraph. And if they have trouble with a prompt, get a prompt in ChatGTP. Get an outline of your topic in ChatGTP and then fill it out. There can be a lot of uh, good uses for AI. And also, we have to know it, like Mauricio says, we have to learn and we have to be ready for some of those ethical questions when they come up. And I really like the idea of putting it in and having them send me both copies. I'm gonna use that, Gabe. Thank you. I, I honestly have nothing to add to what has already been said, so I'm gonna pass it to you, Ignacio. Okay. I will, I will take advantage of your time. <laughs> when when I am checking TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, sometimes I do it to get ideas for my next videos or to check what's trendy, right? And I happen to be curious about things. Unfortunately, I was curious about that. I was checking a video and I said, chat GPTs, wow. And I waited and I watched the whole video. And I think TikTok said, oh, this guy is interested in ChatGPT because he's, it sent me like thousands of videos. And I was like, oh. And I said, I need this in my life. <laughs> so I started and I shared with my, uh, my partners at school. I said, hey, there's something I hate. And that is creating exams. But check what this can do. ChatGPT, give me 10 questions to evaluate present perfect. Please, ChatGPT, make them multiple choice. Right? Please, ChatGPT, change your answers so that not all of them are A, A, A. Right? And I said, wow. And I have my web page. And I said, my followers need to practice listening, reading. ChatGPT, please help me creating a B1 level reading exercise. Wow. I copied that text into Google Translator and I had the voice the audio. I was like, wow. And then he started creating those materials. Yeah. And I find it really, really useful. And then some students, some teachers, some classmates, some friends were, but they're going to cheat. And I was like, okay, tell the student to come to the front and talk about the paper. That's what I want him to do, to speak and to communicate. So I don't want him to read a paper. Come and talk, let's talk about that paper. And then I see if he at least read the paper and had the idea. So I think technology is a really helpful tool. And the more afraid we are about it, the less we're going to benefit from it. One, just one thing, uh, which is, I don't know if you realize, but when we talk about AI, we talk about artificial intelligence, but if you look at my syllabus, the AI section is about academic integrity. 
And there's where we lay the law of the land. I think that we have to stop murdering students and suspecting that they have cheated. Just discuss honestly, provide them with academic literacy and tell them, now, if you cheat, you're going to face the consequences. That's it, right? And AI has its limitations. Ask ChatGPT to make you a list of the 10 most influential articles on X in the past two years. And do you know what it says? I'm sorry. I can only cite things until 2021, right? So let's give our students and ourselves a vote of confidence and try to see one thing we can do with AI tomorrow. Sería muy interesante preguntarle al chat GPT, can you give me the pros and cons of using chat GPT? I've done it. Oh, you've done it? I've done it as an exercise with my students. I've done it as an exercise with my students. And actually, we gave a presentation in the college. The advantages and the disadvantages of using AI, and also, we asked them, how can we detect that something has been created by artificial intelligence. And you have it there. I can send you, I can send you the, what he told us. That will be interesting. Por favor, Dante. So now, the last question, it's about um, something. We're agree that technology right now, it's uh, main point in education right now, all the, um, New, or new students have these new needs and we are facing something too that it's that m more than the middle of the population doesn't have a good access to technology so that can be a big disadvantage for them into the future so according to that it's our last question what challenges does the educational community face in Mexico and worldwide considering the adoption of technology in language, English language teaching, particularly given the digital divide affecting many students? ¿Cuáles son los desafíos que enfrenta la comunidad educativa en México y a nivel mundial considerando la adopción de tecnología en la enseñanza del inglés, especialmente teniendo en cuenta la brecha digital que afecta a muchos estudiantes. I'm not qualified to answer that because I, I come from Disney World. In my country, we all have a computer. All our students have computers. I don't pay for the internet. Well, I pay for the internet at home to watch videos, but uh, I work online all day and I don't pay for that. So I'm not qualified to talk about the divide. I can tell you the advantages of having everybody accessing uh, technology. Well, I, I happen to teach at Disneyland too, <laughs> where my students have access to everything. If not in the school, in their houses, because their economical level is high, and they have access to a tablet, to a computer, to a cell phone, and they have access to internet. And I see some of them can't learn English anyway. But on the other hand, my classes through Facebook, TikTok, etc., get to people in Cuba where they have no access to some tools such as Google Classroom. So in my idea of providing English for free to the most possible people, I had to come up with ideas. How can I get to those people in Cuba or in any other place where they have no access to some tools that for us are basic and simple? I created a program and classroom that you can have access to and follow one book, unit per unit. And they still don't have access to that. So I said, you need to be creative on this one. So I found a Cuban guy who is living in Arabia and has access to everything. And I told him, hey, would you like to help your 
your country? <laughs> and he said, yes, of course, what can I do? And I told him, well, you know what? You're going to enter to my Google Classroom and copy all the links to the videos that I put in order, and you're going to pass them to a Word document, and you're going to export that as a PDF file, so you can send that to your people in your country, because they can open a file, and they can watch the videos. And then you will find somebody who has the book and can share it with them. And he did. So I think the biggest problem with technology is not the access to technology itself, but how willing is a person to really learn. Because when they learn, when they want to learn, they find a way. It's a, it's a bit of a loaded question, um, if, if you'll allow me. Uh, I'll, I'll take a, a different tack. Um, I, I have family members and friends who have decided to, to homeschool their children um, or um, keep things like smartphones and tablets from their small children. Uh, and uh, I, I've been able to see this over a period of maybe 10, 12 years maximum. Um, I, th I think there's some, there, there's a lot to say um, for giving time for students to focus on actual reading <laughs> and, and what can come out of that. Um, last night I was at the Pipiana, I think is the name of the wonderful uh, restaurant down the road here, Pipiana, Pipiano, Pipiano, anywhere, Pipian. And there were three families there with small children, small children, Pipiolo, Pipiolo, oh, delicious. Um, that's why I'm sinking into the sofa right now. Uh, three families, and three of the families had the tablets set up in front of their children as they were eating. I worry about that, that, um, um, the, the impact of, of, of that much digitization. Another story, um, years ago, I, I was working with the Ministry of Education in Ecuador. Um, they were trying to raise English language levels among English teachers across the country. And they, um, they, they gave an exam to all the teachers in the average, I believe, was an A2, and that's questionable in itself. Um, the tool that they used is questionable. Um, the motivation of the teachers going into the exam is questionable. Um, but they decided to resolve this issue by um, providing classes. They realized they could give classes in Quito, in Guayaquil, but they had trouble reaching teachers in more rural areas. So then they went online, and then they realized that access to internet was a problem. I worry sometimes with the digital side, the, um, the sort of quick triggered approach we take to scaling up and thinking we can resolve that. Another quick example, what if we were in Zoom right now? If we had done this a year ago or two years ago, we would have been in Zoom. You know how awkward it was. All of us would be a square. We wouldn't see all of us at the same time. We probably wouldn't see you. Um, that, that lack of connection of engagement is, is a question. All things to keep in mind. I'm, 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 I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm just saying it's something that we need to keep in mind when we're looking at different tools to resolve these different problems. Thank you. Great. Okay, you said something very important, like to be connected, the connections. It's funny or oh, ironic that we are connected but we are disconnected okay we are all the time with this kind of technology and learning through it it's already here and it's great and it's perfect for learning languages and as i told you before different kind of subjects but we are disconnected from each other we we're, we're not having those human relationships anymore it 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 become very cold everything and about teaching uh I'm going to use this analogy, and AI and 
digital uh, applications and technology and different kind of programs can tell you about an ice cream. It's going to describe you the ice cream. It's sweet, it melts in your mouth, it's crunchy when you get to the part uh, with the cookie and everything. It's going to explain you how it is. But why don't we take our students to have an ice cream? To live the experience. That is the challenge here. We have to make them like disconnect from those screens and make them live what is real. So the other thing is that they don't have access. There are a lot of kids and students that don't have it. So what do we have to do? We have to go back to basics, to the traditional, okay? The ones that they have access, it's perfect, it's great. And we also have to think about the different kind of learning that kids have. Some of them are like visual and that's perfect. Some of them are like through gamification and different kind of tools. We also have to think about that. So it's our homework to train ourselves in all the things that we're having right now. Because we were mentioning uh, all of us before, we need to be prepared for what it comes. I was saying this uh, uh, earlier, what happens if the system shuts down? If we don't have any other way of communications and we don't have uh, social media and we don't have internet, what are we going to do? Are you going to stay in front of your group like this? Because you had your presentation uh, through any uh, kind of um, advice. Uh, I'm sorry, this kind of, um, I don't know, you were prepared your lesson using technology. Okay, now you don't have technology. What are you going to do? So we need to be, and Ignacio said it, it's a word that I really love, creative. We need to be creative all the time to apply our lessons to the students. And to be prepared if something happens, if we don't have that access, what are we going to do? So it's our homework to be prepared for any situation that uh, may uh, arise. Yeah, I think the, the key to this discussion is that we have to use what's available to us. We're not going to be able to solve the, the, the internet problem in Mexico or that there's not um, hot spots in every, in every city. All we can do is rely on what we have available to us. So if there's no internet in your school, but you have internet in your home, well then try to use some of these technological advances, maybe AI to help you with your class planning, to research activities, games, activities, projects that you could do, that you could put on paper, make copies or have the students transcribe. So I think we do have to be open, we have to be creative and use what's available to us. Well, the biggest challenge is, we could say that the challenge is that technology is not available to everybody. I think everybody has been through that. I happened to be a consultant for a different company and I was involved into a uh, Proyecto de Educación en Primaria, and that was English for primary in Coahuila, Nuevo León, Sonora, here, Tabasco, Tamaulipas. And I found teachers that said, uh, you're very funny, can you teach in Spanish? Because I am a teacher of math, a teacher of arts, a teacher of history. So this would be like the second challenge. It's not entirely that we have or may not have access to technology. It's how well prepared we are as teachers. And I'm not get, going to go any further because I believe that we have all faced a similar situation. So challenges. One, it could be or could not be access to technology. Because you're right, maybe they do not have access to the platform, but they have a very nice phone yeah, and they do a lot of things in social media. Two, we may have access to technology, but we need to change the mindset of teachers. You're teaching new teachers, you're teaching older teachers, 
that are afraid of their phones, that come with a very old phone because they are afraid of smartphones. So that's a rejection to the new trends. And we have to remember that, as we said, all of us right here, technology is a tool. And I'm going to quote back to some of my colleagues here. Yeah, we have to adapt to what we have. Yeah, and as Gabriel said, we have to make learning happen. So to wrap this up, challenges, we have to face them. Yeah, but we have to remember, when there's a will, there's a way. And as Arthur Ashe said once, see what you have, do what you can, and make it happen. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Con nuestro agradecimiento, por favor, final thought, 30 seconds, each one. I think I will go with, when there's a will, there's a way. And I love the word creator. I think it's awesome. Uh, thank you, Simon, for this, this uh, space. I think the Recrea Academy, these opportunities for us to to talk and have these conversations about things that are happening in the English language, um, I think they're great. So thank you for the opportunity to share with others. And thank all the other panelists as well. It was great to meet you. Well, yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you and all these people really uh, preparing together, sharing all this kind of information, worrying about uh, our students. And let's prepare ourselves because that's what they need, that's what they deserve. An honor to be here as well. Thank you, Dante. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I don't know if Jacob and Paulina are here. I don't see them. I, I just wanted to have a shout out to them. They are teaching at a normal in a rural area about an hour from here. They are teaching the future generation of primary teachers. Maybe we have some more normalistas in the audience. If there's, hey, I, my hat goes off to you. I'll, since I don't have a hat, I'll say Simon's hat goes off to you for the great work that you're doing. If there's one thing you can and should be doing as uh, instructors is opening up your classroom to those new uh, teachers. If they have a practicum opportunity in your classroom, please do. And take the same questions, the great questions that we had on the panel. Try to work through those questions with those brand new teachers because you will be doing a big service to uh, language instruction in Mexico. Thank you. Uh, as a graphic designer that I am too, when I saw the Recrea Academy, I was like, Recrea. And I was thinking about the Spanish word, Recrea, as the moment of Recreo first. And I was like, that's the moment when kids have fun and play. But then I was like, recreate, create in a different way. Which one? The one that makes students learn, right? the one that makes you feel happy and satisfied. And the fact that you are here means that you want to do things better. The, the fact that we are here means we all enjoy what we do. And we care about the people around us. So I would just invite you to keep on that path and I will try to do the best myself someone once said and I cannot remember who that schools are places where children go to see people big people teach right and I think that if I take a message from every wonderful thing I've heard over these past two days and from having worked closely with the team for some time now is that we are taking the wrong interpretation of schools. Schools are not teaching organizations. They have to be learning organizations. Son lugares de aprendizazgo, right? And I think that if we just turn our chip in that direction and focus on the learning, a better future is just around the corner.
Thank you very much. I want to thank Simon and the team for a wonderful event again. Thank you. Pues les agradecemos a nuestros ponentes. Por favor, les pedimos que nos pongamos de pie para una foto oficial. Por favor. Y esperemos estar juntos una vez más en Recrea 2024. Muchas gracias. Eh, les hacemos llegar, por favor, las últimas. Eh, Denise, ¿me ayudas, por favor? Noé. En nombre de la Secretaría de Educación del Estado de Jalisco y en nuestra quinta edición del Congreso Recrea Academy y la tercera Feria Internacional de Lenguas Extranjeras, le damos el presente reconocimiento a Mariana Murguía Ruiz por su participación. Muchas gracias. Mauricio Ortega, por favor. Brian Lawrence Kilkenny, muchas gracias. Ignacio Chávez Melgoza, muchas gracias. David Fay, muchas gracias. Y faltó el doctor eh, Díaz Le, Te lo debemos uno, doctor, estás en confianza de casa. Ya te dimos tres, cuatro. <risa> muchas gracias a todos, muchas gracias. No, que nos juntemos un poco para la foto oficial. Aunque ella trae una cámara muy inteligente. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias.